morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Maggie, and I'm a graduate assistant within the Division of Professional Studies. And I'd like to welcome you to the UMBC IO Psychology Virtual Open House. So we hope that you enjoy the presentation. And without further ado, I introduce you to your graduate program director, Dr. Elliot Lassen. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, welcome everybody this evening. Uh, Maggie also uh, has the distinction of being a recent graduate from our program. Uh, so uh, I've uh, known Maggie for, for some time wearing multiple hats. So thank you for uh, coordinating this. Uh, as you can see in uh, tonight's presentation, what I hope to uh, relate to you are some aspects about uh, our program. Uh, some things that I hope you will find our program to be unique and add a uh, value proposition as you explore your graduate education uh, and invest in your future. Uh, tonight, uh, as you can see, uh, I hope to be joined. Uh, it's not going to be by three alumni. Uh, we, we will have two alumni. Uh, one uh, emailed me uh, earlier this afternoon that uh, she is stuck in airplane traffic, meaning she's on a plane and she can't uh, uh, she can't participate. Uh, so we will be joined by by two alumni. As you can see from the alphabet soup after my name. Uh, in addition to my uh, academic degree, you also see some um, letters uh, that relate to some professional credentials uh, that I hold in the field of human resources. Uh, because as we will see, the fields of IO psychology and human resources are very much related. Uh, and many of our students, after they get their degree, or perhaps while they're going for their degree, they will work in the general human resources space, uh, some in consultancies and some in more administrative uh, aspects within an organization. So, Maggie, we can start with the next slide, please. I first would like to sort of define or describe IO psychology, as you can see from this uh, solar system type of depiction. Uh, you can see at the center of the uh, universe is the textbook definition, if you will, of the scientific study of workplace behavior. Some of you who are familiar with the field of psychology uh, would know that uh, psychology as a broader field can be defined as the scientific study of human behavior. Uh, and here we plug in, instead of human behavior, we're more specific to talk about the workplace. So that is really our working definition of IO psychology. And as we start from the top, uh, the 12 o'clock uh, position of this pictorial, you will see that uh, the really starting point, and I, I like to emphasize this in uh, at this point as well as in the classes, that uh, the field of science and practice is driven by, by theory and uh, empirical basis. Uh, because what we do is part of the overall field of psychology uh, with all of its rich history, but also we will look at the real time, at the here and now data, as we see, as we saw specifically related to the workplace and organizations. If you go to the clockwise, the more of the um, three o'clock position, uh, two of the things that we cover in IO psychology as well as human resources, in fact, is talent acquisition. We can substitute the word recruiting and onboarding with talent ac for talent acquisition and uh, management. Once somebody is part of the organization and uh, there is talent management that hopefully develops the employee throughout his or her lifestyle, life cycle uh, in the organization. Going down to the bottom circle, you'll see that we study organizational behavior and development. We're, we're focusing not just on the micro, not just on the individual employee, but we bump it up a level of analysis to the level of the organization. And organizational behavior, in fact, draws from the fields of social psychology and business, and even to some extent biology, to 
explain and to understand how organizations work and how they evolve. Finally, from the practical perspective, you'll see interventions and, consul and consultative. Uh, I can tell you that uh, when we uh, develop a training program for something, uh, then that would be a, a type of uh, intervention. Uh, I myself, in my career, have done interventions and consultations. And we'll hear uh, later on this evening uh, from one of our alumni who is in the consulting space right now. Uh, so they ha we have uh, consultations that I do, which I, I would call more project-based, more ad hoc going into an organization. Uh, but then there are individuals who work for consulting firms. Uh, and we'll hear from uh, that alum uh, later on in our presentation. So this sets the stage for understanding what the field of biopsychology is all about. Next slide, please. I think it's important to talk about the future. And this program, if you decide to apply and uh, you are accepted and, 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 and uh, you accept us, and you embark in this field of study, uh, it's important to know what's on the other end, what's on the other end of the uh, degree. So I would put the employment sectors for IO psychology, roughly speaking, into these five buckets. And I would say I have had experience in each of these areas, each of the, each of the sectors that are listed here, uh, so I feel well-rounded in that respect. I've been privileged to have many opportunities over the course of my career, uh, starting from a public sector, uh, which is the government. And I have had uh, employment experience uh, with the federal uh, government, uh, both as a, uh, I would say more in, as a consultant, but I have worked side by side by uh, individuals who work, uh, well, for the for the federal sector, uh, but I have worked I have worked in the state sector, which which would be wouldn't be federal government, but would be state government. I worked uh, for the state of Maryland in human resources for ten years, and then you go to the next bullet, which is corporate or the private sector, and uh, I've had experience uh, working uh, for a utility company for a telecommunications company. I've done consulting for those types of uh, companies as well. Next is consulting. And people can be uh, individual consultants uh, where they are independent consultants and they work uh, solo. Uh, they can work as part of a small consulting firm or they can work as part of a large consulting firm. Uh, and that would be from the perspective of an outside or external consultant, but uh, we also have the notion of being an internal consultant within government or within the private sector. So some of our alumni are employed in that, uh, in that space. Then we have the nonprofit space. There can be uh, IO psychologists or uh, uh, HR professionals who work for a nonprofit organization. It's, it's very similar to what one would expect to see in a uh, public sector or private sector organization, but it is mission-based, and uh, mission-based organizations have HR departments, they have internal consultants, depending on how, uh, how large they are. So, uh, and I ran myself a nonprofit organization within the, works, the workforce development area uh, for about five years. And finally, uh, the last bullet is higher education and, and research. So higher education includes, uh, includes the teaching. It also could include if you're working as an internal consultant with, for, a, uh, for a university or college. Um, so in addition to the teaching, you have the, 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 the internal practitioner aspect uh, that can be applied to higher education. And also uh, we've had alumni, we, we, we have alumni now that are working for uh, social science research organizations. Uh, one that's really down the road from us at universities at Shady Grove is, is called Westat. Uh, so we have um, we have uh, uh, alumni that are uh, that are working in those areas. Uh, I do see that there is a question. Um, do you want to put it on the chat, or we could take it? I can see it. 
Yeah. So what does research look like um, for someone in IO psych who's looking at higher ed? Well, th those are really, I, there, I, there are really two uh, sectors on the same line. I could have broke it down, broken it down to a, a research, put it in a different, in a different, in a different bullet, but let's mm -hmm. say if you're working for a university, you could be doing research on uh, employee engagement. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, UMBC was uh, just rated by, I think it was the Baltimore Sun as one of the best workplaces to work. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the metrics that could be used is employee engagement. So there, there is, there is a little bit of a crossover, but in all honesty, I, I could have put research and a research organization, uh, mm -hmm. such as the one I mentioned, I could very well have put that um, as a separate bullet. Uh, we do have connections with an organization called the American, uh, American Institutes for Research in Washington. That would be another example of a, uh, of a social science uh, research uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Next slide, please. Okay, as I mentioned, there are really two sides of the same coin, and, and I, I credit Dr. Abod for wording it in that way. Uh, Dr. Abod, who is the Assistant Graduate Program Director, we work together. Uh, she also teaches classes as well as helps with the administration, and she basically described it as uh, one coin with two sides. So what I did was I went to LinkedIn, and I have many connections on LinkedIn, as some of you might uh, know. And on LinkedIn, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see that everybody has a job title. And what I did was I went to some of my colleagues who, with whom I'm connected, and I took their actual job titles. And, and I, I put this here, and I subdivided the list into IO psychology and HR. The point of this slide, I, I won't go through each one because you can pretty much uh, read for yourself, uh, but I really put it here to show that success in the field is really open uh, to a variety of roles. Uh, and, you know, some people, when they're looking for jobs, alumni and other colleagues of mine, they get too caught up in the exact uh, job title, but I, if you, yes, but, but my, the, the point that I like to make is that each of these individuals that I took their job titles, they all have degrees in IO psychology. They just work under a different package. They just work with a different job title. Not that they're doing the same thing because IO psychology is very diverse. Uh, so they're, they're in fact doing different things. But it really just shows you that there are job opportunities uh, in many sectors, as we saw from the previous slide, as well as having different packaging, uh, packaging to it. So just for example, just to point out a couple, on the bottom of the second column, you'll see a Chief Human Resources Officer, which uh, usually goes by the acronym CHRO. And that is, you know, that every organization has like a CEO, a COO, uh, maybe a CFO, uh, some organizations, instead of calling it a vice president of human resources, the top person on the totem pole is called a CHRO, which means that they interface with the C-level, with the CEO, the COO, the CFO on strategic decisions. And there are usually individuals, professionals who are below the CHRO that are doing some of the operational aspects of, uh, of human resources. On the left side, you'll see personnel psychologists. That was taken from the public sector, or the federal, federal sector uses that job title, as well as a human capital consultant. Sometimes these job titles will have different flavors, like a junior human capital consultant or a senior human capital consultant. So you'll see different, different variations, perhaps depending on level of experience. Next slide, please. Okay, now this slide uh, just uh, is, is a video clip and uh, Maggie has informed me that after this presentation, uh, this slide deck will be sent out. Uh, sometimes with WebEx, it's a little bit finicky and instead of taking a chance that the audio and the visual will uh, run properly, 
Uh, I will just direct you to watch this short uh, video clip afterwards. Uh, it's a well-produced clip by our partners at DPS uh, who produced this video clip where I talk about our courses and our faculty. Uh, so I invite you to um, I invite you to watch that afterwards. Uh, it's a very well done clip. But in terms of uh, just going through the next slide, I, I want to give you a a, a, a program uh, overview about what you might expect. And it's no secret that you might be looking at other uh, other programs, uh, which which is definitely fine. I would like to sort of point out what our program brings to the table in the way that it has evolved. Uh, our program, first of all, uh, got its start in around 2009. Uh, I've been associated with the program uh, since pretty much the beginning, starting out as an adjunct uh, professor, and now I am a full-time graduate uh, program director. So I've seen it through its uh, growth and evolution, and I have uh, incorporated some of my values, professional values, as well as um, reached out to, to colleagues of mine who have helped reinforce the program. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the advisory board in a moment. Uh, but as we saw from one of the beginning slides, uh, our program is founded on scientific pr principles, but it is an applied program. What does that really mean that it's an applied program? Well, some programs are master's programs where you have to do a master's thesis. Uh, PhD programs obviously involve a doctoral uh, dissertation. Uh, our program does not have those requirements. At the end of our program, we have what we refer to as a caps capstone experience, which is a semester long uh, faculty directed consulting project that each of our students do in a real organization. So instead of uh, instead of having a, a somewhat uh, theoretical uh, experiment that would be a master's thesis type, we have an applied uh, project. Now, there is, of course, scientific principles that underlie that, and there's a literature review uh, that is part of the uh, capstone project, but it is an applied project that's the culmination of our program. In terms of our uh, schedule of classes. Our schedule of classes uh, are all evening classes, uh, which means that they start at six. Some will start at seven o'clock. Uh, each class meets once a week. Uh, our typical student, uh, and, and this is the recommended uh, load, will take two courses per semester. These are this is graduate level. As you know, you're going from undergraduate where you may have been taking a full load of uh, 12, uh, 15, or maybe even 18 credits. Here, our students are taking six credits just because I would say a majority of our students are working uh, part or full time. And that is deemed to be the appropriate, uh, the appropriate semester load. Uh, and uh, so one course uh, meets once a week. So our students are coming into the classroom uh, twice a week. Of course, during the uh, COVID, uh, our classes were all virtual, uh, but uh, this semester, the fall of 2021, our previously in-person classes have gone back in-person, of course, uh, with the appropriate uh, distancing and uh, precautions uh, that our campus, which is located in Rockville, Maryland, at the universities at Shady Grove, uh, and uh, they do a very good job in sanitizing and just really keeping everyone safe. Our program is made of two categories of courses. Number one, our core courses. Our core courses I would describe as more foundational, maybe a little bit more theoretical, and they prov provide the foundation for understanding the field. So there are certain requirements to take, a cert to take courses in the core category. Our specialty courses, let's just call them electives for now, uh, those uh, are really a wide variety. I don't think you'll find a wider variety of uh, elective courses uh, compared to ours. I think what allows us to do that is that our program has grown quantitatively. So what that does is it allows us to teach courses in uh, 
compensation and benefits, which we call total rewards, uh, strategic planning. We'll see the list in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but uh, the point that I wanna make is that it gives our students latitude in terms of uh, maybe night of the week, if we, for some of our courses, we'll have the same class, the same course, maybe different instructors that are run on two different nights of the week to give a little bit of flexibility there, but also this flexibility in terms of the elective choices. And we would not be able to do that if we had a smaller uh, number of students. So it's really uh, something that has evolved where we've added uh, courses. Um, and in fact, uh, we've, we've revamped courses uh, to match what the needs of industry are. And, uh, you know, courses that were previously under-enrolled, we've been able to change and update those courses. So I'm very happy uh, about that. I have been known to use the words, seize the opportunity very often, because as with anything in life, your success is largely driven by what you make of it. And we try to provide those opportunities to you for the taking, knowing that you won't be able to take advantage of all the opportunities, uh, maybe because of schedule, but we have found, uh, and I, I, I say this on good authority, that our students who have seized the opportunities, who have taken advantage of, for example, our advisory board mentoring program, uh, or perhaps a uh, practicum, um, or, they've expressed interest in getting involved, involved in a consulting project, or they've attended some of the professional conferences like SIOP, PTC, and, and SHRM, uh, they have not only developed their skills, but they've also created a network. They've created a network that they have leveraged for their own careers and attainment of jobs. So let me just mention, uh, since I've uh, talked about the advisory board, uh, I'll just explain it a little bit deeper. If you go to our website, which is www.umbc.edu slash IO, you will see that we have under people, not only our faculty. So if you want to get a chance to know our faculty, uh, which are made up of um, outstanding, profes uh, outstanding professionals uh, who very often are consultants or practitioners themselves, but we also have an outstanding group of 12. We always have 12 advisory board members who advise us on curriculum, who send us job and internship opportunities, but also uh, serve as mentors one-on-one -on -one with our students. And it's really invaluable. Uh, those relationships that are built, uh, and like I said, there have been jobs that have been facilitated uh, by those individuals uh, channeling opportunities to our students, and then our students already, you know, have a little bit of a relationship. They know a little bit about that organization, so it gives them uh, a little bit of a foot in the door to apply for those positions. Uh, so there have been so many returns on investment for our students who have chosen to take advantage of the advisory board mentorship program. So it's an active advisory board. We lean on them. I meet with them a few times a semester and uh, they've really been, been great for us. So I encourage you to go and see who our people are on our website. I think um, I just saw that Maggie posted the uh, link in the chat, so you may wanna grab that. Uh, the professional organizations, I'll just mention each of them, uh, the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology, the Personnel Testing Council of Metropolitan Washington. Uh, we partner with them for a uh, an event uh, that's usually held in February, uh, and the Society for Human Resource Management. Uh, these are organizations, I guess I would call them the three organizations uh, that are national or regional that we encourage our students to be involved in. Next slide, please. All right, uh, just to do a little bit of math, to circle back on the different types of courses uh, we have uh, 10 courses that are required, uh, and that breaks down to five courses that would be considered core, four electives, and then one capstone course. Uh, each of our courses, uh, with some minor exceptions, perhaps on a, on a uh, practicum, uh, but I would say for most of the situations that we would encounter, each course has, is three credits. 
uh, and our students will take uh, two courses uh, per semester. Uh, we offer, as we'll see, a summer option, and we recommend, uh, if at all possible, that your capstone course, which is your last course along the way, is held until your final semester as your only final semester course, just because of what's involved. Uh, you know, for students that are working uh, full time, uh, it, it it does become a bit of a uh, of, of a responsibility. Uh, so we do encourage, if at all possible, to save that for their last semester. The capstone is offered in the fall and the spring. Uh, so those are two options. Uh, so I would say at the very beginning, we encourage each of our students to map out an academic plan and pace their, themselves accordingly. Next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide, but it's perhaps one of the most important slides in this, in this deck. I would encourage you to uh, peruse it now, and then you'll have it as part of your uh, slide deck that will be sent out uh, after today. And the reason why I say it's an important slide is it has all of our course offerings on the slide. In addition to, I would say, the ability to depend on the course being offered in the semester that is that has the grayed out section in the block on on the block on the right. So as you as you see, we run courses fall, spring, and summer. So there are three courses that we run in the summer as options. I wouldn't recommend that students take all three courses. They are staggered across two semesters, uh, but uh, there are chances to take, let's say, two courses. If you want to take one in the first summer session and the other in the second summer session, uh, that, that might be a possibility. They are compressed in that it uh, each class runs twice a week as opposed to once a week. That's just the nature of a compressed semester. But um, in terms of pacing yourself, uh, there is that summer semester that you can leverage. But I would like to just uh, point out the core courses and the specialty courses. Uh, there are two courses, the uh, 670 and the 672. Uh, by virtue of the fact that they have uh, an asterisk next to it, you see that both of those courses are required, and you have to take both of those courses in your first semester. Why? Because they are foundational and they are prerequisites for almost all other courses. So our your first semester in the program is fixed, where you have to take 670 and 672. We offer three sections of each course, so you have flexibility of which night of the week you take each. Beyond that semester, beyond that initial semester, then that's where your course planning can be more individualized. We do have, as we'll see later, advisors. We have two advisors. I serve as one advisor for half of the students, and Dr. Abad serves as an advisor for the other, uh, the other half of, of the students. And certainly, if you have any questions, uh, we would encourage you to look at the course descriptions, of course, that are online um, to give you a sense of what the course is about uh, to specialize that to your interests. But I would, um, uh, you know, just uh, take a look at some of the options that you have beyond the first semester. So, for example, this semester I'm teaching seminar in applied social psychology, which is Psych 671, which uh, I think is an interesting course uh, that is foundational intellectually to many of the things that we do in IO psychology. I also teach 674. This isn't a plug for just my course. Uh, I have a colleague who teaches uh, that course as well. It's called Methods of Assessment, where we talk about uh, interviews and tests and uh, integrity tests and uh, assessment centers and many things that are used for the selection of employees. For those interested in HR, there's Psych 677. And then we have the specialty courses. Uh, we have a consulting course. We have a, a course called Total Rewards, which, as I mentioned, is compensation and benefits, uh, a course in decision making. 
uh, strategic planning. I teach the summer course in job analysis, Psych 667. We also partner with learning and performance technology. Those are the three courses below that you will see uh, that have LAPT. Those are also counted as electives, and I would encourage you to, um, to, to take a look uh, at what those courses are under the LAPT uh, course descriptions. So look at this slide. You have some asterisks, uh, one, two, three, four asterisks, five asterisks, uh, and uh, you're gonna see what those, what those signify uh, in, the, in this chart. But this is a chart that we, that we update, and this is the most recent version of that chart. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. Uh, as of last year, we launched two new certificate programs, and the certificates are 12 credits, and it's either standalone or embedded. And uh, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> there are some students that, for whatever reason, some prospective students <coughs> who are interested in just one of these certificates. It's a 12-credit commitment, uh, after which they will receive a certificate in either organizational consulting or training and talent development. That could be because of what they're doing professionally. They feel that concentrating in these areas in consulting or training and talent development will help them in their career, help them in their job. We welcome those students who are interested in the standalone credential. On the other hand, <laughs> we have students who are interested in the I.O. program as a master's uh, as a master's degree, but are interested in a sort of minor. Let's just use that term. We usually use minor in the undergraduate space, but they're interested in having that concentration. So they can say they have a master's in I.O. psychology with a specialization in consulting or with a specialization in training and talent development. And that just shows a, a, a an emphasis. Uh, that they have chosen to do in their graduate training. Uh, so the <clears throat> there's information that is available. If this is a track that you're you're interested in, um, you would sort of declare it that you're interested in the uh, certificate once you start the program, and then that kind of puts you in the system. Of course, that requires that you take uh, not only the requirements of the program, but the uh, electives that will go toward the certificate. And it is possible, just bottom line, it is possible to get your degree, one of the certificates, and still do that with 30 credits. You just have to pick your, select, your electives uh, accordingly, okay? So hopefully that was somewhat clear in how to do that. Um, once again, if you're interested in just the certificate, then you would apply in a different way. If you're interested in the I.O. program, you would apply to the I.O. program, and then later on you would contact your advisor or our graduate program uh, manager, Karina Jenkins, and let her know of your intent to uh, declare for the certificate. We have a couple of alumni from whom we'll hear in a minute. But I, I also kind of went back to my uh, archives, uh, and these are individuals who, in some respects, I wouldn't call them, you know, uh, you know, ancient history. These are individuals who may have graduated a year or two ago. Maybe they graduated more, you know, more years ago. But these are individuals who remain connected to our program. We like to think of our alumni uh, as being connected to our program if, even after they graduate. There are opportunities to give back. And we also have tracks where we uh, send out job opportunities that are appropriate for people with more experience. So if we have somebody who graduated from our program five or 10 years ago even, we have alumni that have graduated that long ago, uh, we will have a separate listserv that will send out, let's say managerial director level positions that wouldn't be appropriate for our current students. We also have a channel that we send out job opportunities and internships to our current students. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a default no-brainer. But many of our alumni have elected to uh, want to keep up with us 
uh, including wanting to hear about job opportunities. So these are uh, a list of uh, five alumni with whom I've uh, spoken over the past year uh, or, or had a, a, a correspondence with. Some of these serve as peer mentors to our students. I know that uh, uh, Barb and Elizabeth uh, have served as, uh, as peer mentors. I had a really great conversation with Anne Katrine, who works, she went back to uh, where she's from in uh, Oslo, Norway, okay? And she was telling me how she's sort of the only IO psychologist in the uh, Norwegian government, at least in that section of the government, and, and how she has to explain what IO psychology is. Uh, so I'm very proud that we've had alumni that have made an impact, not just in the local area, but nationally and internationally. Next slide, please. Here are a few others, uh, and uh, here we were able to get some some uh, some headshots, some nice headshots. Uh, the uh, Delora uh, graduated a few years ago, and you can see what her job title is. She works for National Institutes of Health, and as you can see from the beginning, you don't have to read the whole uh, self description, but she is a manager. Right? She's a project manager, and then she manages a, a team of developers, and she is utilizing her skills, her analytical skills, her, her quantitative skills uh, within, as you can see in her description, uh, and she's definitely with, working within the HR space in the federal government. Next slide, please. Twisha. Twisha graduated a couple of years ago, and she is one of our international students. Uh, we have had a good track record of people coming to us from all over the world, spending some time uh, in the D.C. area, coming to classes, participating. And um, she uh, worked for a little bit uh, here um, before she went back to uh, India. We still keep in touch. Uh, she's very energetic and enthusiastic, and she credits a couple of courses. Uh, Dr. Abad, she liked my course for some reason. Uh, as well, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to have an international uh, impact, and she is working, uh, she has a couple of roles, she, wear, they, she wears a couple of hats uh, for, a, uh, for a university uh, and institute in India. So that's, uh, that's Twisha. Next. Helen. Helen graduated in 2017, um, really, you know, she's working within uh, within I.O. for a, a, a technology uh, company. Uh, and uh, uh, Helen, uh, interestingly, she did her capstone project from China. Uh, I, I met with her every week. It was a 13 hour time difference. Uh, and she spent time uh, here, you know, taking her classes. And then just because of the timing of it, uh, she needed to go back for, for work, to back to China, and we did her uh, capstone project totally remote, and this is pre-pandemic. She came back to do her presentation in person. That was one of the conditions that we allowed for that, and I think it was very good that she was able to impart what she did uh, really uh, across, across the world. So that's, that's Helen. Next. And finally, um, Anne, Anne Katrine, uh, she was mentioned in the first slide. Uh, she actually, uh, if you take a look, uh, you'll see her, her, um, her LinkedIn profile. Uh, she made herself available if anybody has any questions uh, with a, an email address. I'm not sure. There is a short video that I recorded with her. Uh, it, if it's not, embedded in what you receive and, and you're really interested, I can, I can make it happen, I can share it with you. Uh, so she did a very nice job in, in explaining what she does. And uh, you'll see in the description, if you give it a read, you'll see how she leveraged her UMBC education and degree in what she is doing now. And I believe that was taken at the graduation outside of the uh, event center. Okay. Um, or actually, the old events, the old event center. Looking at when she, when she graduated. Um, okay, next slide, please. Kendra Lyons. So Kendra Lyons works as a project manager for a uh, an organization 
called Emergency Services Consulting International. That may not be um, familiar to you, but um, actually we've had, uh, we've had some speakers in my class, some guest speakers from ESCI. Uh, we've had some students that have done internships for ESCI, so we have a great relationship with that organization. And Kendra, uh, as you can see, graduated early in the program, early in its, uh, in its uh, infancy, and she recently uh, decided that she wanted to pick up uh, her education and go for a PhD in public policy. So that if anybody, this course is a terminal master's program. So there really is no, um, is no direct track into a PhD program, but we have had some students over the years who said they wanna go for their PhD, some go for their PhD in IO, some go as she's going to be doing, getting her PhD in-house at UMBC on an IO psychology topic. Uh, so that's really great um, that we have that synergy uh, to uh, internally within our university to allow students to advance their education. Next slide, please. Uh, I think this might be the last uh, slide of the, uh, of the students that will not be joining us uh, at the, right uh, this evening, but Shelby works for a nonprofit. Okay, and I think there's a video, there's a video clip that is uh, looks like it's playing uh, below. And once again, I would encourage you to take a look at these video clips that are embedded in the deck once you receive them. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we have maybe one or two more. Um, Brian Reed, uh, he is a 2015 graduate, and she, he works in a very high level position. Uh, as a CAO, a Chief Administrative Officer, using his IO psychology background, and he works for NICHD. Uh, I don't recall what <laughs> that stands for exactly. You can Google it. It is a branch of the federal government within uh, NIH. Uh, and he also, there's also an embedded video there as, as well. Next slide. Okay, this is where we get to the uh, alumni profile. So as mentioned, Nakia, uh, was not able to join us because she's sitting on a plane right now. Uh, but she updated her information. She graduated in 2010, and she um, actually holds uh, two roles right now uh, with the KIPP Foundation, nonprofit organization, and also with a public sector entity, the DC Public, S a public Charter School Board. Um, and uh, she regrets that she's not able to uh, join us. So we have Tyler and Sarah. Uh, I see Tyler on my screen. So I will invite Tyler to uh, unmute himself. Tyler graduated a couple of years ago, um, and he uh, is currently a human capital consultant with Deloitte, but I understand that he will be making a transition shortly, uh, correct? Okay, so he'll, he'll tell you a little bit about his experience at UMBC, but his current job title is as a human capital consultant. Yeah, thank you for the welcome, Dr. Lassen, and it's so nice to be here um, and meet you all today. Uh, so yeah, just um, you know, giving you a little bit of background here. So I started at uh, the UMBC IO program back in the fall of 2017. And something that I found um, throughout the program is that a lot of the courses had very much an experiential focus. And so what I've been able to bring with me from the program has been an overlap with many of the different courses that I've taken uh, and the work that I'm doing today. So for example, uh, there was a performance management course that I took uh, that was taught by the director of performance management at the Department of Justice. And, I'm currently redesigning a performance management process for a federal client and I'm literally taking things I learned from that course and applying them to the workforce um, day after day. Um, same exists for a strategic planning course that I took as well um, and, and various different activities we did during that class. Uh, a lot of just very um, overlapping skills and knowledge you'll, you'll find with the, with the courses here at UMBC and, and a lot of the work that's out there in the field. Um, during my uh, graduation, I was able to um, get a job with Deloitte. And so um, one of the aspects as well about the program that I've really appreciated and 
this is something that Dr. Lassen has um, touched on as well, is just the network of people who not only graduate from this program, but are connected to the program, whether it be through the advisory board, whether it be through the professors themselves. Uh, I've been able to tap into that network and really leverage it. And I've seen other people leverage it too. And you'll find that there's alumni from this program um, who are scattered throughout different roles um, in DC and the surrounding areas and, and around the world. And, um, every time I've looked for a job, I've tapped into that network and been able to um, identify people who've either been able to refer me or give me a lot more information than a recruiter will about um, the positions that are available. So something that uh, Dr. Lassen touched on is, you know, I've been at Deloitte for a couple of years now. Um, I started as an analyst. I was promoted um, to a consultant. I've worked with um, government agencies and help them to uh, redesign various aspects of their HR life cycle. One area really focusing on is performance management. Um, I'm going to be transitioning soon uh, to PwC, where I'll be a senior associate. And the way that I got that job was through tapping into the network that I leveraged, um, that I found through UMBC. And so once again, um, just the overlapping experiential knowledge you gain through the coursework, as well as the network that you um, can leverage through the program itself are some of the main reasons why I've, I'm really grateful for the time that I spent at UMBC. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, just on a personal note, I, I remember when Tyler was actually doing a road trip uh, to check out different programs, and I have this memory of him uh, meeting uh, in my office at universities at Shady Grove, and uh, you know, we talked about uh, you know the uh, the pros and, and the cons of the program, and I was very pleased that uh, he decided to apply uh, and and go through our program, and I, I'm just so proud uh, that he was able to um, really, as he used the word leverage, to leverage the program and leverage the relationships to get to the point in his career where he is right now. So I wish him uh, success in his new role as he makes that transition. We have Sarah Evans, I believe. Uh, Sarah, are you on? If you are, you know, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, Sarah, are you on? Hmm. Okay. I don't see her on the participant list, so I wasn't really checking in that until now. Um, so Sarah Evans, uh, you know, she, I, I would encourage you to go to her website uh, if you just Google Sarah Evans Career Consulting. Uh, Sarah graduated in 2013. So I, I tried getting a, a, a really a combination of those who graduated uh, a, sort of towards the beginning of our program as well as more recently. Uh, and so Sarah would sort of be in the, uh, in the middle uh, of that uh, towards the beginning of our program, I guess. And uh, I have uh, some experience, not just with Sarah taking classes, uh, she took one or two classes uh, with me, uh, but also uh, I served as a bit of a mentor in the field of career coaching, which now she does pretty much uh, as her full-time uh, position. Uh, but when I was working for a nonprofit workforce development organization, uh, she shadowed me uh, and uh, hopefully she picked up a, a thing or two about career uh, counseling. So uh, that that is uh, Sarah. And uh, certainly if you have any interest in getting involved in career coaching, uh, feel free to reach out to her. She's also been a very uh, good friend of our uh, program. Um, next slide, please. Nakia. Okay, well, uh, actually, yeah, so I, I'll just mention, you know, Nakia, this is, uh, you know, as, as mentioned, she wasn't able to uh, to be with us, but this is uh, just a headshot of, uh, of Nakia uh, and the, the two roles that, that she currently is in. If you'd like to reach out to her, I can connect you with her. Next slide. And we have Tyler. Uh, we just uh, we just heard from Tyler, uh, which uh, and then and then finally, uh, finally, uh, Sarah. Uh, with three bullet points about her, uh, she has worked for a large organization, Marriott Corporation, which is located based in Montgomery County in Bethesda. Uh, so she's worked for she's worked for large organizations as a consultant, and now she has uh, developed her own practice in the area of career counseling. So that's Sarah. Thank you. Next slide. 
Okay, so uh, just looking at the time here, I want to leave some time for questions if you have any. Uh, these are some important dates. Uh, our application season uh, begins at the beginning of November. So right now we're on October 12th. If you are interested in our program, let me just give you a sense of the timing. Um, if you are interested in our program, I want to encourage you to go through the website, go through the admission requirements, start to gather your materials before you apply. Um, you know, submit your required uh, materials. One of the things that I have tried very hard to do uh, when we have uh, reviewed applications over the past several years is to try to give you a quick decision. So if you apply, uh, let's say at the beginning of the application season, which begins in November, it goes up until May the 15th. But I would encourage you, if you are interested, to apply sooner than later, because that way we can get you a quick decision and that will help you make your future plans and help you help you calibrate where you're at uh, in your career um, right now if you are working. Um, and um, certainly if you uh, decide uh, to accept us, then you would let us know. We would make sure you're in the system uh, and that you are messaged accordingly. And then uh, our schedule usually begins uh, when we onboard our students at the beginning of June with our orientation. So it's sort of a tight timeline at the end. So we would encourage you to apply early, get your decision early. If you are accepted, accept us early. And that way, you know, everything can, um, you know, everything can be in alignment. Of course, you might be considering other programs as well. So you might want to wait to, to hear other decisions before you make your final decision. But that's sort of the, the timeline that we uh, that we set out. Next slide, please. These are the contact information. So there's a pretty long email address for information regarding the application or admissions. If you have any specific questions about our program, I would encourage you to first look at our website because so many of the questions that I get are answerable by perusing and doing a deep dive into the website. Website is pretty good. It, it's pretty informative and pretty intuitive of where to find information. Uh, so, in addition to what you've learned tonight, in addition to the slide deck with the the slide of the different courses, hopefully that's enough information for you to go on. Uh, in, in, but certainly, if you have a a, a a specific question that you can't obviously find, uh, then you can reach out to Dr. Abad or to me. Next slide, which I think is our final slide. Any questions? I will take a look at the chat. Um, question. As okay. an, you would like to unmute yourself. Yes, question. Yes. As an undergrad student, what can I do to make myself um, competitive for your program? And are there any research opportunities during the summer at your program or any other programs that you're aware of? Okay, good question. Um, the general question I will just uh, sort of reformulate as how to make yourself a competitive uh, applicant. Uh, so I would say that uh, if, you, uh, if you have a, a, a bachelor, if you're going for your bachelor's degree in psychology, uh, that, is, that usually uh, you know, plays well uh, as, a, as a starting point. If you are not, um, if you're not majoring in psychology, then we have two prerequisite courses that uh, are um, for either a research methods or uh, stats course and psych 101. Um, so even if you're not a psych major, you have to take those two courses. So if you're an undergraduate student, uh, you, you need to make sure that that's part of your course plan before you graduate. Uh, we don't really have uh, any research lab because we are such an applied program. Uh, I would encourage you to, uh, get involved in research uh, that does, you know, we do let, take a look at that on the application because it shows that you have some quantitative uh, and research methods uh, experience. So we definitely, we definitely look at that, look at that favorably. So I would reach out to people within your university. If you have an opportunity at your university to take a 
an undergraduate course in IO psychology. I know that not all programs offer that, but that will also uh, play well. We have a, a, a requirement of a, a 3.0 average. So if you are sort of, you know, on the cusp of that, you want to make sure that you uh, maintain that uh, 3.0 or above uh, GPA. Um, and what also might be helpful is, let's say, over the summer, uh, if you can get some sort of position as a, an intern in the in, in the HR uh, in the HR space, reach out to connections that you might have. Um, you know, see about anything that you could do as a volunteer uh, in the HR space. Maybe look for uh, look for an HR assistant job um, that uh, you know that you can get and maybe even hold on to uh, after you start the program. Uh, so those are just some suggestions uh you know I, I would i wouldn't say you have to check off all those boxes but those are some things uh that you have that you can do to make your application stronger thank you for that thank question. you and thank you and one follow-up question when you're looking at research will you appreciate general research in psychology or are you looking for io specific topics i would say at this point it it it, it could be either one uh if i saw somebody did a uh uh, it didn't doesn't have to result in a publication, but if I saw somebody, uh, you know, was involved in a research lab at their university, a psychology research lab, or uh, they even shared uh, as as a as a sample, uh, maybe a, it doesn't it can be a, a paper that was unpublished. Certainly, if it was published, that would look, that would be that would be great. But we are an applied program, so I I don't want to emphasize the you know overemphasize too much. The, the importance of, 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 of having research. We have let students in if they've not had uh, research experience, because after all, we're a terminal master's program and, and not a PhD program. And, and certainly if there's a student that wants to go for their PhD, then you know, that might be, uh, you know, they may want to take a look at a PhD program instead. But certainly we welcome master's students uh, that are, that are you know, looking for their master's degree. And as I mentioned, there are certain students that after a while they will go back to school and they will go for their uh, for their doctorate. So they'll sort of get the best of both worlds afterwards. Thank you. Okay, any other any other questions? Either in the chat. Okay, what is the graduation rate for the students who have taken this program? Um, it's a good question. It's a good question. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but this is what I will say: that if you prepare to make this life change, and we talk about this during orientation, you pre prepare for this transition from undergraduate to graduate or from working uh, you know, full-time to working full-time and, and, and taking a, a part-time load of six, of six credits. And you have support from your family to help juggle those responsibilities, then the graduation rate is is almost 100 percent where we have i think my observation where we've fallen short of that 100 percent is where people don't uh, where prospects prospective students before they start they just apply and then think that they're going to just figure it out and they don't really plan they don't they don't have a conversation with their boss for example that hey i'm going to have to leave at five o'clock on the two nights that i have class to, in, in order to get to Shady Grove campus. And then they end up not being able to get to class on time. And then, you know, once that happens, it's sometimes a spiral. Or unfortunately, there are people that have some life circumstances that are unavoidable. Um, but there are certain life circumstances where if you have your ducks in a row and get that support before you start the program, then uh, things usually go, go smoother. It, 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 it sounds like, Six credits a semester, you know, it's, it's, it's a light load when you compare it to full time, but certainly if you're working full time and also the fact that it's, this is a higher level, you know, it's a higher level. It's not undergrad, you know, the, the, the level of um, responsibility uh, and expectations is going to be higher and uh, it's going to be more sophisticated, more applied, um, more, you know, more, more applied experiences and also taking advantage of the extracurricular. Uh, so, you don't want to spread yourself too thin, but you also want to make sure that you are able to give your energy, your all 
taking advantage, seizing those opportunities at the same time that you're taking the courses inside the classroom and you're doing whatever you're doing. So planning ahead is so critical <coughs> to, to, uh, to graduating, graduating on time. And sometimes, you know, students have to take a break, maybe take scale down to three credits a semester because of things that are going on. That's fine. That's fine. We've had students that have taken maybe three, four, or even five years to finish the program. <clears throat> but then we have we have students that, that were able to finish in two, two and a half years, depending on how they played things. Any other questions in the time that we have remaining? Okay. If there are no other questions, um, thank you for participating. Once again, if, uh, if you do choose to look into the program more, you have the, the PowerPoint deck with the video clips embedded uh, that will be sent to you. You have the website where you can do a deep dive and look around. Uh, and you have us to reach out to if you have any questions about the program, the application process, as well as some specifics about the, about the program uh, it, itself. And I see that Maggie just put something into the chat, which basically something you can uh, just copy and you know, put into your uh, clipboard, uh, but you'll see all this information and what's sent out, uh, what's sent out later. Okay, well, I thank you, and uh, I look forward to maybe seeing some of you, uh, some of your applications down the line. Uh, once again, we do strive to give you a quick, quick turnaround decision so that you can hopefully accept us and move on. Maggie, you have the last word. If you have any, uh, just you could be just saying goodbye <laughs> or good night. Well, like I said in the chat, everyone, thank you for joining us, and we hope that you enjoyed the session and, and got a lot of information out of it. Best, to, best of luck to your successes. Great. Thank you. Good night, everybody.